And so thank you so much for coming to our didactic this morning, Run the ED Like a Girl, Strategies for Training Supervisors to Mitigate Gender Bias in Clinical Scenarios. And Dr. Norman's gonna start us off this morning. So good morning, my name is Marquita Norman. Good morning. Good morning, my name is Marquita. Hi, hi Jen. Good morning, my name is Dr. Marquita Norman. Hi. Good morning, my name is Dr. Norman. So, one of the first things we think about, and next slide, how do we introduce ourselves? So if you're new to a department, which recently I do have experience with since I just transitioned to a, a new department six months, well, not even uh, five months ago, um, when you're coming in, or new resident, new faculty, how are you introducing yourselves? How are we introducing ourselves to our patients? How are we introducing ourselves to our nursing colleagues and other physician colleagues? If you're in a supervisory role, how do you introduce your trainees, your residents? Are you referring to them as, hi, this is Melissa? To other physicians? Not necessarily to patients, because we, we tend to stay kind of in that professional realm of, of utilizing doctor when we're talking about, you know, um, you know, to other, other, to patients. But when we're introducing ourselves to colleagues, who may already have some internal imposter syndrome. When you have a, a new female colleague, do you say, hi, this is Dr. Melissa Smith. And as opposed to, hey, this is Melissa. Because what it does, it gives that person permission and then who doesn't know them to really, in some ways, feel like they can call you by their, you know, call them by their first name. And for lack of a better way of saying it, sometimes you don't know me like that, you know. Um, and especially when you historically haven't been perceived as the physician. So as we know, many women coming in the emergency department are assumed to be the nurse. And I mean, when we go to the intersectionality of, you know, of race and things like that, sometimes I've been assumed not to even be the nurse. I'm, I've been the environmental services worker, even though I'm in full scrubs, um, or, and you know, it, it just gets a little bit confusing. So we have to be very intentional. So that is where we wanna start off. So I am Dr. Marquita Norman. Uh, I'm an uh, associate professor and uh, Associate Chair of Health Equity, Quality, and Safety at UT Southwestern Medical Center. Awesome, thank you, Dr. Norman. And we're just gonna go and introduce the speakers, starting with Dr. Kat Ogle. Hi, everyone, I'm Dr. Kat Ogle, and I am an Associate Professor of Emergency Medicine at the George Washington University. My hats are medical education, ultrasound, and DEI. Awesome, and we have Dr. Agrawal next. I'm Dr. Agrawal, Pooja Agrawal, I'm on faculty at Yale, um, where I am the Director of Global Health Education, um, and I'm excited to be on this panel. Awesome, and then we have Dr. Jennifer Love. Uh, I'm Dr. Jennifer Love, I am a NIH uh, Research Fellow at Mount Sinai and Clinical Instructor, and my hats are in Medical Toxicology and uh, Gender Disparities. Awesome, and we have Dr. Goldblum. I'm Dr. Katya Goldflam. I'm the Associate Program Director at Yale as well. And then jumping over to the other side, we have Dr. Stavely. Good morning. I'm Dr. Taylor Stavely. I'm faculty at Emory. My pronouns are she, her. I'm excited to be with you this morning. And then we have Dr. Fofana. Hi, my name is me. Hi. Oh, <laughs> I just did it. Hi, my name is um, Dr. Miriam Fofana. I am a third year emergency medicine resident at Stanford. I'm an outgoing member at large member on Rams board right now, and I, my interests are in medical education, DEI, and global health. Awesome, and Dr. Norma introduced herself already. I'm Wendy Sun. Um, I'm one of the third year residents at Yale, and I'm the immediate past president of Rams. 
All right, so today, again, thank you so much for being here so early in the morning. We appreciate you. Um, the overview of our didactic today is we did introductions already, and we're gonna talk about the background of gender bias, and we're gonna talk about imposter syndrome, we're gonna talk about tips and tricks inside the resuscitation room, outside the resuscitation room, and we will have time for a question and answer at the end. All right, good morning. So let's start about some, with some of the background data that we know um, that exists in this topic uh, so we can get through it and get to more of the fun stuff. So uh, Dr. Madsen's 2017 uh, study of the AAEM salary data demonstrated um, that physicians earn almost uh, $20,000 less in academic salary compared to men after she adjusted for multiple variables. Next slide. Um, and Dr. Agarwal's uh, scoping review of the literature and suggestions for best practices um, has highlighted the persistence of gender disparities at all levels of the pipeline from medical students, uh, next slide, all the way up to mid and late career attendings. Uh, next slide. And we know that also gender disparities permeate into the clinical space. Um, although these two papers are not specific to emergency medicine, uh, these recent studies did show that physician uh, gender, specifically female physicians, um, can influence outcomes for certain patient populations. Next slide. And finally, we know that gender disparities permeate into our educational spaces. Analysis of feedback um, from attending teaching physicians to peers to nursing colleagues has demonstrated differences for male and female residents. Next slide. Uh, this was a 2019 study of nursing evaluations of emergency medicine residents, and it noted lower rank scores, next slide, uh, for female residents in areas of leadership, professionalism, and that nursing colleagues felt that female residents, um, they were not as comfortable with female residents taking care of quote unquote their family members. Uh, and together, this, uh, these studies are only from the last five years. We have many other studies preceding these, but it continues to shed light on this problem um, that gender disparities persist all across the academic pipeline. And there's ample opportunity for improvement in the way that we retain and recruit women into our specialty. So now I'm gonna hand it over to Dr. Agarwal. I'm actually gonna, I, I moved too much. <laughs> to talk a little bit about imposter syndrome. So everybody knows what this is, everybody has it, we all have it, every single one of us has it. So I'm not gonna belabor this too much, but imposter syndrome, it's that feeling that you're not supposed to be in the room, that there is something, someone made a mistake, uh, someone overlooked something, they thought you did something you didn't do, or they thought you didn't do something that you did do, and you're not supposed to be in this room, and we all have this. We all continue to have this. And I, and I think what we need to start to recognize is that it is, it's something we should be looking at in a very different way. So what is imposter syndrome? I got lucky, I'm nice, so they're being nice, they gave me this great opportunity, I've had a lot of help, I'm not as smart as everybody else, I don't belong in this room, people are gonna figure me out. These are all of that sense of what is imposter syndrome. These are the thoughts that are going through our heads. Next slide. Everybody has it, absolutely everybody has it. Everyone in this room has had it, will have it, will we'll try to deal with it, it'll come back, but we need to continue to be cognizant of it and figure out how we're gonna deal with it in our own lives. What do we do to avoid that imposter syndrome? And I think that this often happens more with, uh, with our demographic than perhaps others, where we try to overcompensate, right? So we will do more work than we need to. We will really, we will give 150% instead of just 100% that's needed and do extra work, spend more time of our own to, to make, uh, to set a standard that others may not even feel like we need to actually make. We procrastinate, right? If I, I just need to like, I need to wordsmith this paragraph just one more time before I send it in. I need to send out to one more reviewer before I feel like it's ready to submit for, for, for publication. We hold back. If I ask a question, someone's gonna know that I don't know, or someone's gonna think that I'm not as smart as I, as I am. Um, I'm not gonna apply for that grant because if I don't get it, then it looks bad, and then my, my chair thinks, oh my gosh, what are we doing with this person? I don't offer my original ideas because maybe they're really just not that good. Maybe it's kind of just something going around in my head. Uh, I try to be perfect. I, you know, I, I, this, this last one here, this little, pair, this little picture to me is like, is so like, per, it's, it's perfect for what we do, right? We hear all these great things. We're like, yeah, yeah, it's, I'm not that great, right? And then one person says something that's negative. You're like, yes, that is what I'm hearing and that's what I'm gonna react to. And we have to stop doing that to ourselves. Next slide. 
So how do we, how do we mitigate <coughs> imposter syndrome in our own lives? There are lots of ways to do this. We first, the first thing is we gotta recognize that it's there. We have to recognize that we are, we are subject to it and we have to be completely intentional about seeing it and doing something about it. The language that we use and, and how we respond to it, right? So someone says something, I feel like with, with Dr. Goldfarm, Dr. Goldfarm and I go way back, way back. and we, <laughs> we have become imposter syndrome buddies where if we're in a meeting and one of us says something and the other person is either not heard or, or someone else says the same thing. We say, you know what, Dr. Goldfam, that was a really fantastic point that you made. I want to build on what you said, and this is what I think about it, right? So we, we build each other up, because when you say something and it falls flat, and then somebody else says something else and they get recognition, that imposter syndrome comes right back. Maybe I didn't say it right. Maybe I didn't choose the right words. So we need to build each other up, find a buddy, um, Ignore those voices in your head that are saying, well, maybe that wasn't a great idea. Maybe you should have said this word instead of that word. Not necessary. Um, all of these things can certainly help in terms of dealing with your own imposter syndrome. And then I have one more slide. <clears throat> if you haven't read this, I encourage you all to read this article. This was put out last year in the Harvard Business Review. And this has changed my view on imposter syndrome. I see a lot of people nodding. I'm happy to see that. Basically, what this article does is it, it helps you, it helps me rethink imposter syndrome. It, imposter syndrome is perhaps not a thing. Perhaps it's not us. It's actually kind of society. And imposter syndrome is built within systemic racism, xenophobia, sexism. It's about how we think the world should be. And we are putting ourselves in that construct. Instead of doing that, let's think about maybe changing the construct changing the way that we think about leadership, changing the way we think about how people should be acting in these, in these situations, and just redefining those rules, right? It shouldn't be about how, how, how men lead. It should be about how do we lead? How is that the best way to do it? So I'm not gonna say much more about this. I do encourage you all to read this. And I'm gonna sit down now. <laughs> Thank you, Dr. Agarwal. I also like to stand up when I'm speaking. So I, I love the I love the cartoon that she showed that had all of the positive comments and then the one negative comment because it leads right into this article. I was a junior faculty member and I was, we were switching from one evaluation form to another and the, the university said that we needed to download all of our evaluations so that they wouldn't get lost, we could keep them in our portfolio. So I downloaded my, my evaluations and you know, Kat does such a great job teaching us ultrasound. We love having her in grand rounds. She teaches me something on every shift. Kat can be a real bitch. That's in my permanent record evaluation. So one of my residents had an experience with me that, that made them feel that I was witchy with a B. This article really talks about how we manage critical cases in like in a, in a code resuscitation. This study looked at internal medicine residents and their ability to run a code. And they were looking at different characteristics that allowed them to control the room, to demonstrate leadership, and to really demonstrate a sense of control. And the idea behind this is if you don't have control of your resuscitation, that has potential negative consequences for your patients. So we all want to be better at maintaining calm amidst the storm as we're running a code. So they looked at both male and female residents and they took down a qualitative assessment of characteristics they considered to be good leaders and bad leaders. So good code leaders, bad code leaders. And as I'm sure you can imagine, the characteristics that they described for a good code leader was someone who was primarily demonstrating typically stereotypical agentic male behaviors, speaking in a deep voice, standing up tall, controlling the room. And what they also looked at in this article, which was very interesting, was the experience of the residents. How did it feel to be in charge of the code? Do you mind going to the next slide? So I already mentioned that you know, they were looking at leadership, but then when they looked at the gender differences between the experiences of these people that were running the codes, the male residents were like, oh yeah, it was kind of stressful. The female residents were having a little bit of a different experience. 
They said, I felt like I had to apologize for my behavior because I spoke so firmly to my, my staff. You know, I, I had to go back after and say, I was really just trying to do the best thing for the patient. They had to over-explain themselves for simply doing what they needed to do that was best for the patient. And so this disconnect between what we perceive as the best behaviors to control a chaotic situation may create an internal sort of conflict for us as women, depending on what our personalities are. We also have to be prepared as educators to, to let our residents know that it's actually normal to feel this way. Because I think sometimes our, our you know, young women residents feel uh, particularly distressed by the disconnect between what they want to do as their default and what they feel they have to do in order to get things done. And so acknowledging that there is a disconnect and there is some time where you're going to have to take off this, you know, your, your hat that you normally wear and you're going to have to put on a different hat to improve your efficacy at the bedside. Do you want to go to the next slide? Again, it's all about what do you need to do to control the chaos? And I think what we need to understand is, is it necessary that we have those agentic traits to be able to control a room? Are there different, way, different ways that women approach a resuscitation that actually make us effective in a different way? Should our male colleagues be adopting some of the things that we do when we're engaging with our team? How are we missing opportunities to learn from each other? Next slide. Y'all have seen sort of the description of, you know, when a woman comes into a room and she's very assertive, oftentimes she's perceived or described as being aggressive. And this sort of leads me into sort of reminding everyone, when you're, when you're describing residents in your evaluations, we've got to be very careful about the language that we're using. And you've got to make sure that you're not using gendered language. And you've got to make sure that you're using language that actually describes behaviors and not stereotypical characteristics. And I think that that was my last slide. Oh, all right. So just, <laughs> it was not my last slide. These were some, some direct quotes from the individuals who actually were studied. And so I can think of women that are just as assertive as men when they're running codes. Now when I read that, I don't know about you, but when I read that, that suggests to me that someone perceives that they're less assertive or effective in other environments. So it's only when they put on that hat and, and the feces are hitting the fan that they can actually get things done and feel like they're powerful and feel like they're effective. I'm not by nature naturally uh, or extremely assertive. I don't really like ordering people to do things. So it took me a while to get comfortable. So this is where simulation comes in. It's, it's helpful to help your residents practice this. Modeling at the bedside. One of the things that I do when I'm helping my junior residents learn how to run a code is I stand right next to them and I whisper things into their ear. Say this, now say this. <laughs> Nobody in the room knows that I'm doing that. But then I give her some support. I do it for my male residents too. Don't, don't get me wrong. Um, <laughs> but. For any of my residents who are new in this role, I, I want them to feel supported, but I also want them to be the person who is actually controlling the room. And so I think that that's one way that you can stand with them, acknowledge that they're going to be uncomfortable in that position, and give them some tools and some language they can use. I try to my best to look authoritative, but it's really stressful. <laughs> you know, I don't know, we all manifest our stresses and our anxieties in different ways. Um, when, I'm, when I'm real stressed, my neck starts to turn red, you know, and my cheeks start to flush. And uh, some of my residents are like, oh, she's got her serious face on. <laughs> she's got her mom face on. So, you know, just acknowledging those nonverbal cues that your residents may be giving you or your students may be giving you when they're in a stressful situation, normalizing that because we're not robots, and then giving them some tools and recommendations for how you deal with those things. There's more, yeah. there's <laughs> more, all right. I'm not gonna read these, I'm just gonna put these up. And I'm, and I'm curious, how many of you have said something like this? Okay, 
a couple. How many of you have heard your colleagues say things like this? So next time your colleague says something like this, normalize her feelings, acknowledge that it's okay to have those feelings, and also tell her that she's totally normal. <laughs> like this is actually a completely normal response. So I want to expand just a little bit on this concept of agentic versus communal traits. Um, I want to expand on it not because I support this dichotomy, that I support this dichotomy in gender or having traits that are certain genders, but because depending on where you fall, and most like, like most of us, you probably have characteristics that are in both categories, it might predispose you to certain pitfalls in the workplace. Um, and so like we've discussed, you know, agentic meaning someone who has agency is someone who's dedicated and powerful and decisive and quick thinking, right? And someone who's communal, as in builds a community, is more caring, empathetic, has more warmth. Um, and like I said, most of us probably have a bit of all of this. But depending on kind of which side of the spectrum you fall more towards is going to affect how people see you in the clinical workspace, whether you like it or not. So I want to talk more, let's say that you are more on the communal side. This is who you are, and this makes you great. But being more communal means that you're more likely to have episodes of role incongruity, meaning that who you are as a person, who you, what you bring to the workplace is going to be incongruous with what work asks you to do. And that's not your fault. It's just the way that our, our job is, the way that being a leader is, and it's the way that you are. And you shouldn't have to change who you are for that, but you're going to be more predisposed for that incongruity. And so it's something to be mindful of. And on the other end of the spectrum, if you're more agentic, you have a higher risk of having a likability penalty. So likability penalty is a term that is um, widely attributed to be coined by Sheryl Sandberg, who's the COO of the media company that owns Facebook. Um, and she noticed as she went further and further in her career that she took on more and more of a likability penalty, meaning that she felt as she displayed more and more dedication and competition to reach that high level of success in the business world, that she took on this penalty, meaning that I no longer was as likable. I was successful, but I no longer was as likable. And so I bring up this dichotomy not to say that this is how things should be, but just to have your own awareness of what pitfall is it that I might encounter in the workplace and how can I overcome that? And in terms of overcoming it, I think that the biggest thing is to think about how is it that I'm going to handle conflict? So as an agentic person, am I going to handle every conflict that comes my way with my agentic traits or am I going to bring in more of my communal side? Um, am I going to be defensive in this, in this moment of conflict and more reactionary, which is probably more agentic, or am I going to take a step back? And on the other hand, if I'm more communal and I'm running into an issue with conflict, am I going to be avoidant because that might be a little bit more communal? Or am I going to take on more of an agentic role and be more decisive? And so having that flexibility and knowing what pitfalls might come your way I think is very important. Next slide. All right. So before we go to our scenario, I just wanted to kind of summarize some of the points that we could. Thank you. Some of the things that um, junior residents could do to help them um, in the resuscitation room. So like Dr. Norman was saying, introductions are so important, especially when you're starting out at somewhere new. It's important to introduce yourself, what your role is. And sometimes you might have to say that a couple times for people, you know, to overcome whatever biases that they have already. And next, you know, assigning roles is very important and oftentimes, you know, it's helpful as like the tending to also say, you know, my senior resident, you know, Wendy or, you know, or Dr. Sun is going to um, run this resuscitation um, today. And so that kind of reaffirms that the resident is taking this leadership role. And of course, positioning is really important, like standing at the head of bed. I think for me, when I'm in the resuscitation room, sometimes I like to wander around. So I tell myself I got to, you know, stand there and kind of um, what Dr. Ogle was alluding to later, like your positioning, your body language is extremely important as well. And of course, the attending whisper is super helpful. And the whispering kind of goes both ways too. Um, not only do they whisper helpful things, 
I feel comfortable whispering things back to them so that, you know, as a team, you know, we're all on the same page. And I often find that it's really helpful to take a pause to summarize, make sure everyone is on the same page and also elicits ideas. Because oftentimes like team dynamics is super important and people like to feel that they're working together, you know, to treat the patient and, um, you know, working together like that. And of course, if there's ever, um, you know, procedure that a resident might have to do, it's important to have that clear leadership handoff by stating, you know, I'm passing, you know, the role of, you know, running this code to doctor, you know, insert their name. So these are just a couple of helpful tips and tricks inside the resuscitation room. So now Dr. Papana is going to give us a clinical scenario. So for the next part of um, our presentation, I'm actually going to read a case scenario to, to everyone. It's very long, so I'm going to try to make it uh, concise. And then I'm going to interact with you guys. Let me interact with a component of our presentation. So I'm going to ask you guys, you know, what would you do if you were the junior resident, the chief resident, um, well, senior resident, rather, um, or the attending in this scenario? And then I'll ask um, the attendings on the panel as well as what would be the more appropriate thing to do. Okay. All right, so the first case is um, the charge nurse informs you of a stroke code activation in the field of a 75-year-old woman, last normal 30 minutes prior to evaluation with hypoxia, aphasia, and right-sided weakness. She, her estimated time of arrival is seven minutes. As senior resident, you prepare for the patient's arrival uh, by updating your attending of the expecting patient. Tell the junior resident to prepare for a possible intubation and assign roles in the resuscitation room. The patient arrives normal intensive on, on oxygen, hypoxic, somnolent for intermittently speaking to EMS with a right leg deformity. <coughs> EMS reports that the patient is a healthy, year old, a healthy 75 year old female with no past medical history who experienced a witness fall while going down the stairs in her home. She was, you know, mentating normally. She was anal times four, she was GCS 15, um, denying any head trauma and loss of consciousness with a chief complaint of right leg pain. She was given morphine of unknown amount for pain control, and shortly afterwards, she became confused, um, unable to answer questions, and hypoxic to about 85% on Lumiere. The stroke code was activated in the field due to concern for, for stroke. The ta you tasked the junior resident, John, to assess her airway and neurological status while, while access is confirmed and another line is placed you request point of care glucose, which is normal, and then you ask the ED pharmacist to drop 0.4 milligrams of IV Narcan due to suspicion for um, opiate overdose. As a junior resident is doing his examination, he reports that the patient is apneic with palpable pulses. You tell him to start bag valve mask ventilation, and then you request two milligrams of IV Narcan. It's a higher dose. Um, instead of 0.4 milligrams, that, um, and afterwards, um, nurse, you ask Nurse Sam to administer uh, prior to intubation attempt. Nurse Sam responds, no, she's 75. That's too high of a dose, and she's a stroke code. Let's intubate her and get her to the CT scanner. You explain to Nurse Sam, I understand the concern, but due to the large dose, or unknown dose, rather, of um, morphine that she received, um, I'm concerned about opiate overdose. Then um, Nurse, Sam, Nurse Sam responds, I don't agree with your plan. I'm not giving the Narcan. Nurse Sam turns over to junior resident John, who's a white male, and says, you're going to allow your junior resident to practice like this? Who turns over to me, speechless, while bagging the patient. You respond, I'm the senior resident, Nurse Sam. I'm not disregarding your concern. And I understand your hesitancy. If you don't feel comfortable giving the Narcan, I can administer it myself. You look back to your attending, who nods, then runs to the trauma bay to manage an unstable patient. The pharmacist gives you the Narcan and you administer, and shortly afterwards, the patient's respiratory status and mental status improves. Examination of the patient reveals an NIH stroke, which is basically a stroke scale that we utilize to assess the patient's neurological status, was zero, with the right leg weakness, with right leg weakness being attributed to concern for a possible right hip fracture. So, um, I know this can be a little overwhelming, um, and might be, uh, some of you might have some anxiety with regards to answering this question, but um, my request to you all is 
um, what would you do if you were either the junior resident, the senior resident, or the attendant? I'll hand over the mic to anyone who is interested in responding. And you know, you don't have to respond if you don't want to. I can just ask the panel. But just wanted to know if anyone's impression based off of their experience. So I wonder if there are there any junior residents in the room? Yeah. Okay. All right. All right. Easy. What no pressure. <laughs> no pressure. <laughs> <laughs> no pressure. Okay. So So as a junior resident, I would support my senior. Um, and I would acknowledge like the nurse's frustration, but I would say, I know you seem frustrated with the plan, but I agree with my seniors um, evaluation of the situation um, and I'm gonna back my senior resident. So I'm actually a senior resident and I find that this happens quite frequently. Um, so what I've started doing, I, in the moment I used to explain myself so at this point, I kind of just do what I need to do, say, let me take the meds, I'll give them. But afterwards, inevitably, somebody will say, hey, what happened? I'll have to have a little debriefing about why I made a decision to be assertive. Um, so I find that the most frustrating part. But in the moment, I've, I've had the transition to stop explaining myself and just get it done. Yeah. You didn't have to. Correct. didn't have to. And it, it actually affects patient care, unfortunately. We're always stuck in this situation. Uh, what about some, oh, right. So I can comment as an attending, because um, I'm a young appearing <laughs> attending, um, especially with a mask on. And um, I've found that preemptively doing the debrief after I have that encounter, where because of patient care, I need to do something or state something more assertively, and then preemptively approaching the person that we had that interaction with and saying, hey, I wanted to touch base with you and explain what, what happened between us, make sure we have a good relationship going forward. Um, and, it, when, and I find when I start that conversation, it can build relationships that you need next time you're doing a resuscitation. Yes. So I'm no longer a young attending, which makes me cringe <laughs> a little bit. Um, but I think uh, Dr. Hawk's point of the relationship is incredibly important. I will also say that an overreaction in this situation, one that doesn't add towards relationship building, may make things worse next time. Um, because, I mean, I can give you an example from last week where a male nurse caught something in the middle of a recess that I had missed that was critical and they were able to speak up in a polite and professional way and say, I see something I'm worried because we had the relationship and it made a difference in the patient's care. So having the relation, being in charge is not only about giving orders, I think, but also being a component of the team and building those team relationships. And I often think it's the relation, the absence of the relationships that make it hard, uh, at least initially. I just wanna um, make an additional point. Thank you for bringing up the teamwork point um, to address a comment you made around, you shouldn't have to explain yourself. So I think we all need to be comfortable with being challenged. And that's actually a safety um, component of a, team, of a team working together. So I just want us to think about, I think it's a great thing that that nurse challenged you. You may not like to be challenged based on the fact that you're junior versus senior, male versus female or whatnot, but you acknowledge it and tell them who you are and this is what we're gonna move forward and here are your options to, to be a part of the team. Either I give it or you give it and, and you move forward because it's about the patient. So I would agree, if I was the attending on, it would just be um, really simple. I support my resident's decision. I think it's a fair, I acknowledge your concern about you know, needing to protect the airway, but we, we, it's a simple uh, first step to ensure that we even need to proceed towards that route. Um, but I've also had uh, an attending um, whom I've worked with in the past, um, who I think it was a scenario where the child was hypotensive, airway, it was, it was a seizure event. She wanted to give the child a little bit longer, but the nurse was so concerned that she went out the room and tried to solicit male residents support that this child needs to be intubated right away. And it got to the point where, um, you know, afterwards, 
she was threatening to um, write to the medical license board to report her. So, um, and I mean, it's an ongoing issue at the moment, but it can get, it can escalate. And so I think it's really important to debrief afterwards, like acknowledge right away and try to have the discussion immediately afterwards. But I can understand also at the time, I mean, this is a really sick patient. You may not have the bandwidth to focus on the nurse's concern, but it does need to be addressed because it can escalate. And then, I'm sorry, I was going to, oh, we can take one, can we take one more? Yes, we can take one. Um, <laughs> just reiterating that this is Dr. So-and-so and this is her recess. Does that take away from, I guess, relationships that a female provider would have with a nurse by using a title when they refer to this person as a junior resident and I'm saying this is Dr. So-and-so? Um, how does that empower or create issues with the relationship? Okay. All right. <laughs> And lastly, I'm going to turn the question over to, you know, our um, panelists. You know, what would you have done differently? I'm assuming if you were the attending. Um, I guess I could start and just uh, to normalize the over-explaining for anybody in the audience. I've been, I'm still a junior attending, but I've been an attending for five years and I still over-explain myself um, in these stressful scenarios. So. Uh, if you do it, it's not a flaw. It's just something I think we tend to do. Um, I think what I have realized is that I can use that over explaining as a teaching moment when we're not in that critical scenario and I can kind of uh, spin it a little bit and say, okay, let's all talk about like the physiology of Narcan and like what it does and how we dose it and kind of try to ease the tension a little bit by like having an educational opportunity for everybody who's participated, maybe go a little bit farther into detail than like to kind of move it out of that tense situation and all circle back and say, okay, now do we all understand why we were treating the patient or prioritizing this or whatever not? Um, because it allows education for everybody. Maybe, you know, this is a brand new nurse who has just started and has never taken care of patients with opioid overdoses before. And so it allows for the nursing staff to learn and your residents to learn and everything like that while trying to diffuse the tension a little bit, but then also come back to the team dynamic of like, we're still building this as a team, we all work as a team together, um, I think has been a way that I can channel my over explaining um, in a like productive way. Thanks so much. Um, and next, Dr. Savely is going to talk about outside the resuscitation room. Yeah, so this bridges really nicely with the case we just, just discussed, which is about the resident and nurse relationship. About a year ago, I did a qualitative interview study with uh, women residents and wanted to learn more about how their gender identity affected their professional development. There was a few really interesting themes that came out of that, and one of the major ones that I want to talk about is the resident-nurse relationship, specifically tensions between female nurses and female residents. Over and over again, I heard from my residents that that relationship and that strain of that relationship was actually probably what depleted their cup the most at work, even more than consultants um, was the, the, the female resident and the female nurse relationship. So these are a couple quotes, I won't read all of them, um, but the last one particularly I think really speaks to it, which is with nurses, it's a very different bond. I'm always trying to be super nice. And if they question anything, sometimes I feel like I have to really explain, sometimes over explain. So we've all, in the course of today, have heard that. That's our strategy. And again, while we don't want to have to do that, we know that sometimes it's, it's needed. Um, and so I want to talk more about, well, how do you overcome this? How do you overcome this tension that I found over and over again that my female residents identified as one of the major sources of their anxiety and their stressors at work? So a huge approach for me was to start thinking about it and reframing that difficult conversation and saying that um, maybe he or she is coming to me and challenging me um, not because of who I am or what I look like, but because 
you know, they truly believe that the best plan is X and I truly believe that the best plan is Y. And coming to them saying, you know, it seems like you and I both really care about what happens to this patient. And that's great to see. That you and I both care so much about doing the right thing for this patient that we are reaching this little bit of a conflict. And so approaching it with that attitude rather than this is about my abilities or my competency being undermined and that it's more that um, there's maybe something that I have to learn from you and something that you need to learn from me. And so as we've discussed, I think that how critical the patient is, so inside versus outside of the resuscitation room, really is going to guide the format and the way that it happens. So inside of the resuscitation room, you know, that closed loop communication is critical. But then in times that are less critical, having that, that debrief and that conversation, because as we've all mentioned, that resident nurse relationship, that physician nurse relationship is one that must be preserved for the next patient that walks in the door. You have to preserve that relationship. And so coming at a conflict with the perspective of this nurse cares so much about what happens to this patient and so do I, and that's why we're butting heads, not for other reasons. Even though those other reasons might be present, even though those microaggressions might actually be driving it, if I'm reframing it in my head is that we both really just care about what happens to this patient, it helps me, it helps me kind of get through the day. Yes, please. So, so I had a life before medicine. I was actually a nurse before I became a physician. And <clears throat> I became a nurse because I was the first in my family to go to college. And I didn't know anything about medical school other than it was really long and really expensive. And I was that nurse. I was that nurse that was asking a gazillion questions. And I was asking a gazillion questions because I wanted to know the physiology. I wanted to know what was going on. I wanted to understand why they were making the decisions that they were making. And so when my residents get frustrated with their nurses challenging them, I tell them my story. And I'm like, it's possible that this nurse wants to go on to do something else. They may want to become a PA. They may want to become a nurse practitioner. They may want to go to medical school. And, and so by, by helping them to understand your clinical reasoning, you're actually building yourself up as a team. So I just wanted to throw that in. All right, so um, we talked a little bit about the inside the resuscitation room and then outside the resuscitation room. And as I mentioned initially, I'm an associate program director, so I'm going to take it even a step further out, which is that a lot of times I'm not there real time, but I get these evaluations. Um, and a lot of times I have a hard time knowing exactly what to do with them. So yours is a great example. You know, if I get one that says so-and-so is a witch with a B, then what do I do with that? Because I show that to my resident, my resident understandably is upset. Um, and it is, I think a lot of you guys have already alluded to this, which is that that, main, that that relationship does need to be maintained for the sake of the team dynamic, for the sake of the patient. Um, and so I think that, that that sort of interpretation can be really, really challenging. And so I'm trying to think of ways that we can um, essentially even the playing field and to make sure that we get constructive evaluations for every one of our residents. And I won't go through the, the literature, but as we've all said, there's plenty of literature out there saying that those evaluations are not equivalent. So what can we do to sort of, again, even that playing field? Um, Wendy, thank you, yeah. So the, um, the, and actually a lot of the, the literature is not from medicine, but from, um, so the Harvard Business Review was mentioned once before, but even from outside of medicine, there's a lot of data saying that to female, female uh, not physicians, but any, any kind of worker or employee gets feedback that's much, more, much less specific um, and le much less actionable, sort of more generalized. You know, you did a good job, but nothing that's really skill specific or, you know, technical skills even less so. Um, so if the way that you can sort of set your evaluations to make sure that you're getting equivalent data on everyone is, for example, you can have specific criteria that you as a team discuss and say that these are the things that behaviors that demonstrate mastery, right? So these are the things that we're looking for in a resuscitation room. You know, you did cl closed loop communication. You ran the plan with people. So again, very specific pointers um, that, you can, that you can have people give feedback on. And this is essentially sort of faculty development, right? Sort of teaching your faculty what you're looking for to make sure that you actually get quali qu quality, not qualitative, but I guess that too, but quality data um, to give back to your residents. And then having three key outcomes, I mean, you can make up any number, but as an example, these are the three things that I want every one of my residents that I'm responsible as an APD to be able to do in the resuscitation room and then saying to faculty, this is what I'm looking for, please give this feedback on every single person that you evaluate. 
And similarly, um, looking at the actual length of the eva evaluation, so there's data out there that says that women get shorter evaluations. So again, it'll be something like good job as opposed to so-and-so did a really great job on this technical skill that, you know, blah, blah, blah. <laughs> Um, that is going to be, again, a stepping stone for them to improve what they do. Um, and, and it is really, there's, there's this concept of protective hesitation or protective hesitancy that I came across actually in, in researching for this, which I think is great. It, a lot of times people are, I mean, we all know it doesn't, it's not fun to give negative feedback, right? But sort of not giving that data because you're worried that someone's going to be upset about it, that's really a missed opportunity. Um, and so encouraging faculty that even if you're worried, you know, you don't want to make the girl resident cried, don't worry, we can handle it. As a matter of fact, that's what we want and what we need to really be able to improve and sort of improve our skills just like the male residents. Um, so I think uh, the other thing just, again, as a step back, it's sort of something that's early on, um, but uh, having talked to, you know, Wendy is one of our fabulous, obviously, residents and, and a couple of others, I think on a residency level, it's also, and, and some people have mentioned this, but to normalize this on a residency level, so intern year, having some residency leadership time where you say, look, this is an issue that you will probably face, and, you know, not just the female residents, but the male residents as well, and saying this is a way that you can be an ally, but this is not just you, so that people don't have to come to this realization somewhere second year, third year, when they finally talk about it, um, that, that they're not the only ones experiencing this. So I think there is definitely something that we can do at, at, at you know, if not an institutional, at least a residency level, um, that any, anyone in residency leadership, I think, should be thinking about as well. Thank you so much, Dr. Goldflam. So we have three minutes left, and Dr. Fofana has one more clinical scenario to give us. Three minutes. Three minutes. Three minutes. <laughs> <laughs> Easy, right? Um, okay, I'm going to speak fast. Um, you got it. <laughs> I'll try to condense it. So you have a new patient, 45-year-old male, um, who presents with repression of abdominal pain for two days with fever, um, nausea, vomiting, poor appetite. Um, on presentation, he's found to be hypotensive. Um, uh, and febrile. So you order fluids, you give him, oh, you order fluids, <laughs> um, uh, and the plan is to do a septic workup and get an ultrasound. So an ultrasound is conducted, um, and it reveals a distended gallbladder with wall thickening and positive sonographic Murphy sign with no gallstones. Um, and so uh, you pay general surgery due to concern for <laughs> acoclus cholecystitis, and this is the encounter. So a consultant calls, and, um, and this individual says, hi, I was paid for a concern for cholecystitis. And you answer, hi, my name is Maria. Yes, the patient presented with two days of fever, nausea, vomiting, ribocardin, abdominal pain. And this individual cuts you off and said, I saw the chart, cholecystitis without gallstones. Then you respond, yes, this is, there is a concern for acalculus cholecystitis, especially considering all other infectious sources being um, having, been, having been, and then he cuts you off again. And he says, you sound like a junior resident because you obviously don't know what you're talking about. Who is your senior resident? I'm not going to see this patient until I speak to someone more senior than you. Speechless and feeling defeated, you tell your senior resident the situation and he speaks to the consultant. And he tells the consultant, I understand your frustration, I apologize, she may not have related appropriately. I have a concern for acoclus cholecystitis, especially given the patient's sepsis and physical examination findings. Okay, thank you. So see you soon. So he hands you the phone and walks away. And to make matters worse, the patient's nurse comes over and says, the patient saw his ultrasound results in his phone and he wants to go home. So you go to the patient's room with the nurse and the patient says, if the ultrasound's negative and I don't have an infection, then I, I, I wanna go home. Um, and you answer, um, based off of your ultrasound results, we are concerned about an infection called acalcus cholecystitis, which can, then the nurse cuts, off, cuts you off, but the ultrasound result doesn't say cholecystitis. I told the patient earlier that since his blood pressure has been normal since we gave him fluids and we didn't find any source of infection, he can go home. Then you answer, I understand the confusion, but based off of his clinical presentation and the patient's ultrasound results, there is a high suspicion for it. You turn over to the patient and you explain your impression. Um, and then as you're doing that, the patient's nurse you know, leaves the room um, and, um, and comes into the room interrupting the conversation with his senior resident. Um, who then um, interrupts your conversation, reiterates what you were saying to the patient, um, and then you leave the room frustrated, um, and you think, what am I doing wrong? Um, um, I've, tr I've been doing all the right things all day. Like, am I doing something wrong, something specific about me that's um, giving me all, you know, a lot of challenges that I've been, ex I've been um, experiencing with this patient today? And so the senior resident um, then comes up to you and says, I think it's best if I take over this patient's care and you see another patient. Um, you say, okay, and at the end of your shift, 
you learn that the patient was admitted for a cholecystectomy due to concern for a calculus cholecystitis. Um, do we have time for at least one? <laughs> two, two, two or three. Comments. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> um, I'm sorry if I was speaking fast. <laughs> We're tight on time, but um, if uh, any of you, if there was an, if you were an attending or a senior resident, junior resident, um, I please leave three responses. Uh, what would you have done differently?
All right, I think in the interest of time, Dr. Agarwal wanted to make one last point because I do want to get everybody to the plenary. You can talk. Yeah, just one quick comment, and I think it's something that came up in Dr. Fofana's um, case scenario that we didn't touch on was the gender dynamic, right? So the junior resident was Maria, and I think you mentioned the senior resident was, was not female identifying. And so that, that dynamic, I think, is really important here, and I think it probably has a lot to do with how that all played out. And so considering that, and honestly, personally, and I don't have any problems doing this, is calling that out a little bit in some way and saying, is there a reason that, that you had an issue specifically with this resident in speaking with you? And I don't, I don't speak to residents anymore, honestly. When, I, when it's gotten escalated to an attending level, I will only speak to an attending. Mm -hmm. And make sure that it's at that level where an attending knows that their residents are either, either being unprofessional or not responsive in the correct way so that they can start to deal with it within their own structure of their own department. So I think that's also important when you're in that world of leadership, when you're in that attending role, that you're taking responsibility for other attendings and making sure that they're taking responsibility for their residents. And so just a couple of other nuances to consider and how that might have affected uh, the dynamic and how that affects the way that you interact with the people in that specific situation and debrief in real time. Yeah, so thank you so much everyone for coming today. Here are some takeaway didactics, although, you know, from the conversation that we had today, and thank you so much for all your participation. It was very engaging, and I do thank you for coming, um, coming to our didactic this morning. I just wanted to put a plug for AWAM and RAMS, like if you're not a member of the Academy and part of RAMS, um, please join us. So thank you so much. <laughs>